John Law is probably better known for his colorful and eventful life in Europe than for his contributions to economics, but I'll point out a few of those ideas in the next few slides. First, a quick note on his life. Law was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1671, just south of where Adam Smith would be born only 52 years later. And he had anything but a dull and uneventful life. Alfred Marshall, for example, said that Law was reckless and unbalanced, but that he was also a genius. In his early life, in his 20s, Law was convicted of murder after killing somebody in a duel. He was sentenced to death for that crime, uh, but it was later reduced to somehow merely to a fine, and his murder conviction reduced to manslaughter. Law went on to become a gambler and lead a, a colorful life on the European continent. So I thought we'd start by trying to get a sense of how John Law fits into the overall history of economic thought. And this quote by Joseph Schumpeter, the great historian of economic theory, I think is pretty telling. Schumpeter argues that Law in fact, belongs in the front ranks of monetary theorists of all time. And we'll see some of his ideas on monetary and financial economics in just a few minutes. I'd also add that in many ways, um, Law's ideas were also well ahead of uh, their time with respect to things like supply and demand, uh, his uh, subjective theory of value, and the macroeconomic concept of the circular flow. We'll touch on all of those in the next few slides. John Law in many ways is considered to be a precursor to the great 20th century economist John Maynard Keynes. And while Keynes himself actually never mentions Law by name in the general theory, both men are noted for their beliefs that the macroeconomy can be stimulated through policy, through both monetary and fiscal policy. And even aside from that, there is some evidence that uh, Law actually is the one who originated the concept of the circular flow model, uh, the flow of income and expenditures in the macro economy. Uh, it's most notably connected in early economic thought with the physiocrats of the 18th century, but again, some evidence that Law himself is the one who originated uh, that concept. Here's a pretty standard diagram of the circular flow of income and expenditure. As I said, Law is credited with developing the concepts that underlie this model. So as you can see, the, the macro economy here is basically split into factor and product markets. And the households and firms are tied together in what's thought of as a circular flow of production, income, and spending. Uh, so in the factor markets, Households are supplying labor, they're supplying entrepreneurial abilities uh, and other things to firms. The firms are then using those factors of production to, to uh, create the goods and services that the households purchase through the product markets. Uh, in the factor markets, the households are being paid. And they're receiving wages and other payments um, from the firms in exchange for supplying those factors of production. And the households then use those payments, uh, the wages and the other payments they receive to purchase goods and services from the firms in the product markets. Uh, finally, the firms are selling goods and services to households in those product markets and then it, it use the funds they receive to purchase factors of production. And as you can also see, there is a role here for government, which is providing services to both households and firms and receiving tax revenues from both. And there's a, a role also for financial institutions, which uh, is a big part of Law's contributions to economics. Uh, the financial institutions are basically connecting the savers and the borrowers. So they're uh, providing loans and receiving interest uh, on those loans. There had been some important work on the subjective theory of value prior to John Law. In particular, the School of Salamanca in Spain did some uh, important work on this. But the classical economists who come just after Law uh, uh, go back to an objective theory of value. Uh, John Law actually had 
a subjective theory of value in which he combines use and exchange value. Those concepts date all the way back to Aristotle, in fact. Law combines them into a subjective theory of value. The subjective theory of value is one that holds that values determined by the subjective uh, desires of the buyers in a marketplace. And so what law does is explain exchange value by the usefulness of a commodity and by its scarcity. Uh, and uh, law tells us, for example, that value arises whenever things are useful, but that how much value those things have is determined by the greater or lesser quantity of them in proportion to the demand for them. Um, and so, as I said, the later classical economists will go back to an objective theory of value, uh, such as a, a labor theory of value, for example, which holds that value is embedded in an object. It's not subjective. Uh, and I should also mention that John Law raises the famous water-diamond paradox, which is most notably associated with Adam Smith. And Law explained it using this subjective theory of value. He says that water despite its usefulness, has low exchange value because it's available in quantities that far exceed the demand. Uh, and he tells us that diamonds, by contrast, have little use but high exchange value uh, because the demand for them is much greater than their quantity. Law publishes a couple of things on monetary theory in 1704 and 1705. First, his essay on a land bank, and secondly, uh, his work on money and trade. And in this work, Law argues for a central land bank that would issue paper money, inconvertible paper money, that was to be backed by the land of the nation. And he chose land because it provided uh, what he saw as a constant yardstick of value, uh, whereas the value of metallic money of the sort that the mercantilists were advocating uh, fluctuates with the prices of the metals from which that money is made. Uh, increased money, uh, an increased money supply in, in law's view should expand trade, should in increase employment, should increase production. Uh, as we said earlier, Law and Keynes, for example, both think that monetary policy in this respect can be stimulative. Uh, Law also stresses that money is, a, is really just a government creation, that, it, that it, it doesn't need any intrinsic value as gold or silver would have as a metal. Its only function, in his view, is to serve as a medium of exchange, not to serve as a store of value. So as I said, law believes that a uh, higher money supply is stimulative to the economy. Here's his original quote, or, or one of them, on this topic. He tells us here that a greater quantity employs more people than a lesser quantity. He's talking, of course, about a quantity of money in the overall economy. Uh, he goes a bit further. He ties this into... Um, the banking system and the money creation process there. We'll see that in the next couple of slides. John Law does write about the fractional reserve banking system and he does tie this to the money creation process. I'll talk about that in just a minute. What he's advocating is a credit-based banking system and unlike a lot of uh, writers in the history of economic thought, Law will actually be able to implement many of his ideas, and I'll say a bit about that as well. So he's advocating a credit-based banking system as opposed to a specie-based banking system. Uh, what's the difference? So the basic difference is on the asset side of the bank balance sheets. In the specie system, uh, assets uh, are comprised of gold and silver uh, or specie. Uh, in the credit-based system, the bank's assets, uh, among other things, include loans to uh, private and public borrowers. Liabilities in both cases are deposits and uh, bank notes. And so the, this is a fractional reserve system 
in the sense that the bank is retaining funds that are equal only to a fraction of its customer's deposits. Uh, and the remainder of the customer deposited funds are then going to be used to fund investments or loans that the bank makes to other uh, customers. And I would also just note that this is a, a noticeable break uh, from mercantilism, laws preferring paper money and credit rather than specie, rather than gold and silver. In talking about the fractional reserve banking system, law describes how money can actually be created by that banking system. And so he originates the idea that money is created through bank lending. Uh, it had earlier been thought that bankers merely transfer money from one party to another, but there hadn't really been an idea that banks themselves could actually create money. Um, but law explains that in fact they can. And in his uh, fractional reserve system, as we just described, only a fraction of deposits are held by the bank as reserves. The rest of those deposits are typically loaned out to other customers and of course the bank has an incentive to do that because they earn interest on the loans. So what happens to those loans? Well they end up as deposits in other banks. Uh, those banks that receive the deposits then end up lending a portion of those new deposits which end up in yet other banks and the process continues in this fashion and every time a loan is made and then deposited in a new bank we get a little bit of money created. I mentioned a, a few moments ago that Law is able to implement many of his ideas in practice and he does this in what's called the Banque Generale. This is a conventional bank that opens in June of 1716, Law had actually tried for a while to interest a number of countries in his monetary and banking system, finally found a willing participant in France, so that's where this bank is open, and Law himself becomes the Minister of Finance in France, he's head of the bank. The bank is performing many of the country's fiscal functions, and Law's bank is going to provide uh, financial capital that will be used to exploit the resources of French Louisiana. These resources apparently were uh, wildly exaggerated in order to attract investors, um, but the bank is going to help finance a company uh, that is taking over the monopoly on trade with Louisiana. This is going to lead to uh, the Mississippi Company bubble for which John Law is probably most commonly known. John Law's adventures in French North America, his Mississippi Company, can get a little complex and a little beyond what we want to do here, but Law is most closely associated in history probably with this episode. Um, so what's happening here is you get investors from across Europe who are quite eager to play in this, in this new market. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, share prices in the, in the company, in the Mississippi company, started around 500 per share in, in January of 1719. By the end of that year, we've seen an increase of almost 2,000% in the share prices. So we're up to... Uh, around 10,000. Uh, we're getting new millionaires all over Europe and so people are taking advantage of uh, this rapid price appreciation. Uh, one of the problems is that that law was willing to issue banknotes to fund purchases of shares in the company. Uh, and in early 1720 we start seeing some downward pressure on the stock price this happens as some investors are cashing out their shares. They're, they're selling uh, their shares. And to stop that sell-off, law decides to restrict any payment in gold over a certain amount, over 100 livres. The uh, paper notes of the bank uh, 
uh, were also made legal tender. Uh, that means they can be used to, to settle most debts to pay uh, taxes as well. So the company is trying to get people to accept paper notes rather than gold. And the bank actually promises to exchange its notes for shares in the company at the current market price, again, of around 10000 What this does is it increases the French money supply very sharply. We get a uh, high rate of inflation uh, as a result. And law decides in 1720 in a series of stages to start devaluing the shares in his company. And this uh, leads to the collapse of the price bubble. So that's a quick overview of Law's contributions, mostly with respect to um, banking and monetary arrangements. There are a lot of interesting things out there that you might uh, want to take a look at. The Garber paper on a famous first bubbles that I just mentioned is, a, is an excellent one that includes uh, some of jo uh, John Law's um, work. Uh, there's a book called John Law, Economic Theorist and Policymaker, and uh, a, a paper in the American Economic Review um, about John Law's monetary theories.